our heads in preparation for the teaching of God's Word. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who took on human flesh so that he might live a sinless life, so that he could die as the spotless Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. We thank you, Lord, for that substitutionary spiritual death on the cross. We thank you for the resolving eternal life by faith in your Son. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity now to grow in your grace and have an increasing awareness of our identity in Christ. We pray, Father, that the believers here might receive the Word of God with positive volition, sanctify us through your truth because your Word is truth. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, and uh, we're continuing our series on the 50 things that God has given to us the moment of faith alone and Christ alone. If you're following that list, or if you still have that list, I think we're going to try to, I'll send a note to my secretary, right, to reprint print that list. Uh, we have new visitors who don't have that. So, uh, number 23 out of the 50 things that God has given to us, the moment of faith alone and Christ alone, is the fact that the believer is possessor of every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Let's take a look at the passage in Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. First of all, he starts out with the word blessed, blessed. And we have the Greek word here, eulogetos, and we get the word eulogy uh, from this Greek word. This word means being worthy of praise. So God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, is worthy of our praise because of what he has provided for us in Christ Jesus. He is called here the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. And this points out the fact that Jesus Christ calling uh, God his Father demonstrates his deity, demonstrates his deity. Now, uh, certainly we can all call God our Father, but Jesus has a unique relationship with God calling him his Father. He shares the exact attributes of the Father. As a matter of fact, when he used that phrase that God is his Father, the Jews accused him of blasphemy because he was claiming to be God. Let's look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 18. John 5, 18. Notice here in verse 17, but Jesus answered them, and, but Jesus answered them, my father has been working unto now, and I have been working. So he's reflecting the nature of the father. Therefore, the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. <clears throat> See, that was a claim of deity. I share the same attributes as the father. I share the same characters or qualities of God the father. So by claiming Jesus Christ uh, is um, in verse uh, Ephesians 1, 3, is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ indicates that Jesus Christ is deity. As a matter of fact, that's where the believer is placed. He's placed in Christ at the end of the verse. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings. Where? Where do these spiritual blessings flow from? Our union with Christ, being in him, in him. Now, we have two blessings in this verse. Notice here, we have the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is to be blessed. And then we have the believer who is blessed. So we have twofold blessing. We are to bless the Father, meaning we are to give praise to the Father. But you know what? We are blessed as well. We are blessed in the sense that he has conferred his blessings upon us with these spiritual resources. 
and they're called spiritual blessings. It's interesting that when we think of God's blessing in our life, we normally think of, well, I'm blessed with family, I'm blessed with you know, Christian friends, I'm blessed with a job, I'm blessed you know, with, with financially, whatever. We think of material things. And certainly we are blessed with material things. But you know what? Even greater is our spiritual resources. Our spiritual resources. And the only way to really discover those is to study the scripture. The scriptures indicate those blessings we have in Christ. And by the way, he mentions, this is a one long sentence in the Greek. Even though we have a period here in verse 6, in the Greek it continues, notice comma, in verse 3, 4, uh, 5, comma, and then we continue on, comma, in verse 8, comma, in verse 9, and actually even 10, but it actually goes down through verse 14. This sentence is one long sentence in the Greek. He mentions some of those blessings we've already discovered, uh, and there's few. There we'll discover more of these blessings as we continue this series. We're forgiven all our sins. We have redemption in verse seven through His blood. Um, God has given us an inheritance. Verse eleven. God has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise. Verse thirteen. God has redeemed us. Verse fourteen. Uh, here. We have been chosen. We saw that for a purpose and plan. God has adopted us in verse 5. So he mentions some of those spiritual resources and blessings in this sentence. And of course, as we study the rest of the Word of God, we find out exactly all the things that God has given to us in Christ Jesus. And in my study, I found 50, 50 things that God has given to us at the moment of faith that we in Christ. So I'm going to include this in the 50 but this is really a summary of everything that we have in Christ Jesus. We're blessed with all, with every spiritual resources, meaning every kind of blessing. The Greek word pos means every kind of blessing. And notice they're spiritual because they're given or imparted by the Spirit of God. And as a matter of fact, it's the Holy Spirit that places us in the body of Christ. And so the Spirit places us into the place of blessing. You ever think about that? When we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are baptized by the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and placed in the position where we can receive all these benefits. We are placed in union with Christ. And in union with Christ, all these spiritual blessings flow. All this, and this is our identity in Christ Jesus. To be in Christ is to be in the place where these spiritual resources are provided. Now let me give you a summary here uh, from Harold Honer's commentary on Ephesians. By the way, Harold Honer was a professor uh, of New Testament Dallas Theological Seminary until he passed away. And he has written probably the most exhaustive commentary from a dispensational perspective on the book of Ephesians. Just a masterful, really thick commentary on Ephesians. And um, he says this in his notes on Ephesians 1.3, summarizing what this verse is all about. The following list answers several questions in regard to spiritual blessings. Number one, who has given these benefits? God, who is the object of praise and the subject of the blessing. To whom has he given these blessings? And this is very important, only believers. Only those who are in Christ and those are believers. The unbelievers do not have any of these blessings. Now, God does bless the unbeliever. God does provide for the unbeliever many times. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and unjust alike. There are certain things that God blesses the unbeliever with, but only believers, though, can uh, experience these blessings, meaning those who are in Christ. And with what has he blessed them? With every spiritual benefit. Where has he blessed them? In the heavenlies. Think about our identity in Christ. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Look, look at um, Philippians 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. 
Our citizenship is in heaven. Think about that. Spiritually speaking, we are heavenly citizens. We belong in the heavenly realm. We belong in the heavenly realm. And one day, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're pilgrims and strangers, we're on the earth. He's going to take us to be with the Savior in heaven. But we are already seated with Christ in heavenly places. Ephesians 1, verses 20 through 23. Spiritually speaking, where is Christ? Christ is in heaven. Where are we? Where's the believer? In Christ. Therefore, we are seated where? In heavenly places in Christ. Now he speaks about the power that raised Christ from the dead, verse 20, Ephesians 1, 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and then he seated him, God seated him at his right hand, and then where? The heavenly places. There's the same uh, area where we are. Christ is in heavenly places. Where are we? We are in Christ. He's far above all principality, power, and might, and dominion, every name of his name. Uh, he's above angels. And by the way, angels cannot remove these blessings. We're seated in Christ above angels. And he's put everything under his feet. And he gave him to be the head of the, uh, all things to the church, which is his body. We are part of the body of Christ in the heavenly realm. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, <clears throat> This position in Christ, we want to talk a little bit about our position in Christ. And, and some of, to some of you, this is a review, but it's very important that we remind ourselves of our identity in Christ. We have the top circle, bottom circle analogy, which is, I think, very helpful in making a distinction between our position in Christ and our walk of fellowship with the Lord. Our position in Christ is the top circle. So the top circle, we speak of union with Christ. When we say stay that we're in Christ, as Paul does, we are united to him. That's why we use the terminology union, union with Christ. So the top circle pictures are union with Christ. The bottom circle pictures communion. And that's easy, union, communion. Communion means fellowship. So the bottom circle speaks of our walk, our fellowship with the Lord. The top circle, we can use the term position. We call this positional truth. The bottom circle is practice. So remember the P, position. Bottom circle is practice. So union, communion, position, practice. In Christ Jesus, that position is irrevocable, irrevocable and permanent. So what God has provided for us in Christ is eternal. cannot be revoked. We are adopted, for instance, into the family of God. God cannot disown us. We can never become unadopted. We are forgiven judicially of all our trespasses. God can never say you're not forgiven anymore. Uh, we have an inheritance. God cannot remove that guaranteed inheritance. Now, we will later go on and understand that we have an inheritance also, in addition to our guaranteed inheritance, as a reward by our faithfulness. There's a twofold inheritance. But our guaranteed inheritance is permanent. Everything that God has provided for us in that top circle, in that position, in Christ is permanent and irrevocable. Positional realities are confirmed to the believer at the point of new birth. So these are not second blessings. You know, there's denominations in charismatic say we need to pray for the second blessing. Well, we have already experienced God's blessings when we believe. We have all the resources we, that we need at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. God has already blessed us. Think about that. I have been blessed. I'm not that I will receive blessed. I have been blessed with all these things at the point of new birth. Personal sin in the life of the believer does not affect our position. What if I sin? I'm still adopted, by the way. I'm a child who's not obeying the Lord, but I'm an adopted child, see? And uh, everything we look at in, in Christ, sin does not affect. Personal sin does affect the bottom circle. When we sin personally, we're not in fellowship with the Lord. We're in carnality, we're out of fellowship. That's why we need 1 John 1, 9, simply to own up to our sins 
in order to restore this walk with the Lord. And then we need to be controlled by the Spirit of God in, in our relationship with Him. So the bottom circle is temporal. Personal sin affects our fellowship with Christ. The Holy Spirit places us in union with Christ at the point of faith alone in Christ alone, as we saw in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. In Christ, we become members of the body of Christ, and that is designated as the church. In Christ, we receive his righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1, 30. Positional realities, therefore, gives us what we call spiritual identity. When we speak of our identity in Christ, we're talking about who we are. This is who we are in Christ Jesus. I'm part of the family of God. I have, I have his righteousness. We need to look at ourselves from our identity perspective. Therefore, bottom circle, we should live Christian's life based on our position. That's why in Ephesians 4, 1, we are told to walk worthy of the calling wherewith we are called. In light of our position, here's our <laughs> practice. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling wherewith you were called. And that's one of the benefits we have in Christ, as mentioned in Ephesians. We are called to live a godly life. God called us in our position in Christ to walk and live a godly, walk according to his principles and live a godly life. So we should live based on our identity of who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, the Apostle John speaks of our fellowship with the Lord in John 14. He says, abide in the vine. When he speaks of abiding in the vine, he's not talking about abiding here, as a lot of commentators state that. We're broken off, we're broken off of our position. No, if we don't abide in the vine and fellowship the Lord, we're in carnality. And when we're broken off from him, we're broken off of fellowship with him. So John's use of the word in Christ or in him is different than Paul. John uses the phrase in him to refer to fellowship. Paul uses the phrase in Christ to refer to our position. So we have to be careful when we see that in John chapter 15. So we are blessed with all these spiritual assets and resources in the heavenly places in Christ. Now let's move on here to the next spiritual benefit here, number 25. The believer is made acceptable to God in Ephesians 1.6. Just a few verses following it indicates that we are accepted in him. Now, what's interesting about this word accepted in the Greek, it's the Greek word kerito, and it means, comes from the Greek word charis, meaning grace. It has that connection to grace. Uh, the idea of being accepted, we could say we have been graced out in Christ Jesus. God has lavishly bestowed his grace upon us. So we have been graced out in the beloved. We have been given much grace uh, in, in our position in Christ Jesus. And so in that perfect standing, uh, we have been made righteous, A, through imputation. God has imputed his righteousness to the believer. And we're going to look at those passages here in a minute. Secondly, in our position, we're being graced out. We have been set apart positionally. We call this positional sanctification. Thirdly, we have been perfected forever graced out in Christ Jesus. And fourthly, we are qualified for an inheritance in that heavenly position. So being graced out, being accepted in the beloved, the believer is made righteous. God has imputed his righteousness at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verse 22 <coughs> Notice in Romans 3, 21, he talks about the righteousness of God that is bestowed apart from the law. You know, the believer doesn't obtain righteousness by living according to the law. No one can be righteous by keeping the law. The law reveals man's sin. The law wasn't given to make man righteous. 
Righteousness is revealed from God by faith. Verse 22, it says that the, even the Old Testament law witnessed the fact of righteousness which comes by faith. Now you say, where? In Genesis 15, 6, later on in Romans 4, we will see that Abraham was justified before the law was given. Abraham was justified by faith. So the Old Testament mentioned by the word law and prophets, that means the Old Testament scriptures. See, the law and the first usage in the word, verse 21, means the Mosaic law. So we have to be careful that the law, notice how the King James distinguishes the word law in verse 21. Lowercase and uppercase. See that? So we're not talking about the same law here. Uh, the lowercase law would be the Mosaic law. Uppercase law would be the scripture. And I think that's why they capitalized, in this case, the word law. Even, even though it's the same Greek word, namos. Namos, law. It's two different concepts. So let's look at verse 21. We can translate, now the righteousness of God apart from the Mosaic law is revealed. So God has given righteousness apart from keeping the law. That righteousness is revealed in the law, meaning the Old Testament Pentateuch. We call the law the first five books of Moses and prophets. Law and the prophets is the Old Testament scriptures. The law and prophets, notice. So this righteousness was, re was witnessed in the Old Testament. Righteousness that was obtained apart from keeping the Mosaic law was witnessed by the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, I think in, in later Romans 4, we'll see that Abraham was justified before the law was given, and he was credited righteousness. We call that justification by faith. Uh, Abraham was given righteousness. Now, verse 22, even the righteousness of God, whose righteousness is it, by the way? God's. God is the source of this righteousness. How do we receive it? Through faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we receive this righteousness. It's through one act of faith, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. And it's to all and on all. On all has the idea of impute, imputation. It's on you. It's, it's credited to your account, those who believe. For there is no distinction, meaning no distinction between Jew and Gentile. All can believe the gospel and receive God's righteousness imputed to the believer at the moment of faith alone in Christ alone. It's on all. It's to all. It's for all. And it's on all who believe. Now, let's take a look at Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. Romans 4 verses 3 through 8. And here Paul gives an example of righteousness that comes through believing uh, apart from the law. And he mentions Abraham. Abraham was saved before the law was given. He was justified by his faith. What does the scripture say? That's always a good question to ask. Not our man's opinion of how he can be righteous with God. I think I can be righteous by keeping the golden rule doing to the others as they would have them do unto me. Or as the pagan would say, do unto others before they do unto you. <laughs> no, that's not in the scriptures. But how can I be righteous? Well, Abraham did what? Abraham believed God. And that faith was accounted. There's the word for imputation. Legitomai is a, a Greek term means to credit. So when we talk about imputed righteousness, we're talking about crediting righteousness to our account. Think about a debit and credit card. And I could place money on someone else's credit. Or I could say, I'm going to pay this bill with my credit card. I'm going to take care of that bill. But think about the Lord Jesus Christ crediting to us something we didn't have before righteousness. That's imputation. So Romans 4 is a great chapter of imputation. 
We had the word accounted or credited, legitimized. So Abraham believed God, and it was placed on his divine account, righteousness. He was given or credited righteousness by a simple act of faith. It wasn't because he worked for it. Now, one of the great sayings of Chaper concerning grace, grace cannot incur a debt. And Romans 4, 4 indicates that. Now, him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Is the boss being gracious to you by giving you a paycheck? No. He can be gracious to you by giving you maybe a Christmas present as a gift, uh, but that's not uh, a, something that he owes you. Understand that. I find it funny, funny that employees all of a sudden expect every year some kind of bonus or Christmas gift. But the boss doesn't owe you that. That would be a debt or obligation. The boss is giving to you that Christmas present as an act of grace. Now, God gives you something not because you work for it. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt, meaning that boss owes you for that labor, whatever you agree with. You agree with him to work for a particular salary. Uh, that's not grace. That's an obligation. So salvation is not promising to serve the Lord as a payment. That would be debt. Grace is something given apart from deserving. And that's why faith is only compatible with grace because faith is not doing something. It's believing. It's believing. It's receiving something. Think about that. But to him who does not work, but believes. That shows you that faith is not a work. And this is where the Calvinists come in and say that faith means commitment. No, faith is not a work. It's not a commitment. Faith means turn from your sins. No, that's an act. That's a work. Faith is not a work. Faith is the opposite of work. It's not doing something. It's believing. It's believing. You don't have to work up a sweat even to believe the gospel. You just have to believe that. I agree with that. That's not a work. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited. There's a word that gets him for righteousness. And David described this also as the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. God will not credit to our account, back to our account, sin. Why? Our sin debt has been paid for by another, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was imputed to Christ. So think about imputation. All the believer's sins have been imputed, actually the sins of the whole world have been imputed to Christ. He bore that penalty. And so the great exchange is our sin debt for his righteousness. And when we believe in him, he imputes to us perfect righteousness. We call that imputed righteousness. So Romans 4, verses 3 through 8, speaks of imputation. Romans 4, 24. Let's go down to verse 4, 24. But for us it shall be imputed to us who believe. By the way, the word credited is the same Greek word. Diff just a different Greek word, different English word. That's the word for imputation. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice, the only way we can receive this perfect righteousness is through faith in the gospel. Christ is our object of faith. Now, 1 Corinthians 1.30, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, notice positional truth, who became for us wisdom from God. Now, wisdom from God can summarize the next three terms. What is God's wisdom versus the world's wisdom? God views us as in Christ having his righteousness. God views us as holy in him, set apart. And God views us as redeemed. So 
in Christ Jesus we are redeemed, in Christ Jesus we have righteousness, and in Christ Jesus we are sanctified positionally. We're going to look at that positional truth here in a minute. There's also positional sanctification. We are holy in Him, in our position. Then we have here First, uh, Second Corinthians five twenty one. Second Corinthians five twenty one. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us. There's a great exchange. He made Him to be sin. How did He do that? Imputation. Our sins were imputed to Christ when He died on the cross. He was sinless. So those sins were not inherently his. Those sins were our sins. Now there's two types of uh, imputation, as Chaper in, indicated. Uh, he mentions a uh, sins with, or imputation, which refers to things that are characteristic of the believer or the individual, and things that are not characteristic of the individual. Christ did not sin. He did not deserve to be, to uh, received the sin debt, but he voluntarily decided to accept that sin debt by going to the cross. He became sin for us. Now, the second uh, imputation is mentioned here, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, not through a process or of works, but the moment we place faith alone, we receive imputed righteousness. So, we have two imputations here. We have the imputation of our sins to Christ, and the moment we believe the gospel, we have Christ's righteousness imputed to the believer. We call this the great exchange. My sin debt for Christ's righteousness. Next, notice here in uh, Philippians 3.9. Philippians 3.9. And being found in him, there's your position, right? Union with Christ. Not having my own righteousness. Notice that, which is from the law. He's saying almost identically the same thing he said in Romans uh, chapter 3. My righteousness is not obtained by law keeping, but it's through a simple act of faith. By that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So he's talking about a righteous righteousness that's not obtained by being good. This is a righteousness that's received by faith alone in Christ alone. This is called imputed righteousness. It flows from being in Christ. Once we're connected to Christ, we share in that righteousness. We God views us as righteous in him. Now, the next resource here that is under the fact that God has made us accepted or has graced us out in Christ Jesus, is the fact that the believer is set apart positionally. Keep in mind with the doctrine of sanctification that the root word means to set apart. And that inanimate objects can be set apart. This table can be set apart for a purpose, right? It's set apart. It, the purpose here is here, uh, Kathleen set this up so I can put my laptop on this table. And in that sense, we could say it's holy. <laughs> you ever think about holiness in the Old Testament was ascribed to objects. There was objects in the tabernacle that were set apart for, God, for a purpose or for God's use. So the basic root word of being holy is set apart. Now, obviously, believers can be set apart too. But keep in mind, objects can be set apart and be called holy and set apart, set apart for a purpose. But the believer, though, the believer, once he believes the gospel, is set apart in Christ, and therefore holy in him. That's called positional sanctification. Now, there is an aspect of ongoing sanctification and ultimate sanctification. We call the second aspect progressive. Just like the three tenses of salvation, there's three tenses of sanctification. There's positional that we have, we're holy in Christ. There's progressive, be holy as I am holy in our walk. And there's ultimate, we can be ultimately like Christ. Ultimate sanctification occurs at glorification. So sanctification has three aspects, but we're only looking at that positional aspect here. First Corinthians 1, 2, 
1 Corinthians 1, 2. The Corinthian church, they are set apart in Christ Jesus. They're sanctified, not through some prayer or some second act. See, this is where the denominations that teach you got to pray a prayer to be sanctified holy is false. We are already set apart in Christ. See, they call this a second work of grace. First work of grace is the gospel. They call the second work, I'm going to be sanctified holy through some kind of dedication or some kind of prayer or act, which is false. We are already holy in our position. They don't understand the denominations that teach that, and I can name which ones, but the denominations that teach that teach uh, that the believer is not really in union with Christ, as the scriptures indicate. They do not understand the doctrine of positional truth, those who teach that. We are already positionally accepted in the beloved. Now, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, if you're part of the church, you're part of what? Christ's body in, in Ephesians 1. To those who are set apart in Christ Jesus. Now we have a series of Greek words. Uh, hagizo is the verb here. We have the word hagios uh, related to the fact that we're all we're saints. Notice we have the same root word here. Uh, it's, it's spelled for sanctification. H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. By the way, you have that little comma before the uh, vowel in the Greek. You have what's called a rough breathing. You add, you add an H in front of it. Uh, and you pronounce it hagizo, or you pronounce it with that rough breathing. And you have the word saints, spelled H-A-G-I-O-S, sanctified and saints. So we have a related term. We are set apart in Christ Jesus in our position. And therefore, in that position, we're called holy ones. We have the idea of saints. It's an adjective. It's descriptive of who we are based on the verb being sanctified in Christ Jesus. So once we are set apart in Christ, we are holy. We're a saint. Lewis Berry Chaffer said the word saint is never ever used of our practice or experience. And the Roman Catholic Church has it wrong. And they only pronounce people saints after they're dead. You know, such and such was a saint because they lived a, a, a holy life or a sanctified life. No, all believers are saints. So I've always said you can start calling me St. John. <laughs> Just like St. Bob over there. St. Cheryl, you know. You're all saints, right? We're all holy in Christ Jesus. Uh, they only canonize certain people that live the holy life. But the Bible says that every believer is a saint. And I'm a saint when I'm sinning. You ever think about that? How can that person be? When I'm acting unsaintly, I'm still a saint. <laughs> While I'm sinning, I'm a saint. I'm a saint who sins. Think about that. <laughs> uh, just like I'm part of the family of God, I'm a son who sins. So when I sin, I'm a saint who sins. I shouldn't sin. That doesn't reflect my identity. But I'm a saint. I'm holy. I'm holy in my position. Now, I said you can call me St. John, but please do not call me St. John the Divine. <laughs> I'm not divine. <laughs> that doesn't mean I'm God. But I'm a saint. And every believer is a saint in their position. Never ever refers to the believer's practice. Now, we're holy in our position. I have Christ's righteousness. I have, I'm holy in him. And what's really interesting is he's addressing this to the Corinthian church. Notice, to the church of God, which is a Corinth. And that church contained the good, the bad, and the ugly believer. <laughs> All three. <laughs> Just like one of my favorite Westerns, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mainly the ugly the Corinthian church. They're called saints. That believer who's involved in sexual immorality, that believer is a saint, but he's not reflecting his identity in Christ. Certainly, that's not a license of sin. 
That indicates so that the believer is not reflecting who they are in Christ. And that's why he encourages believers not to commit sexual immorality in 1 Corinthians 6 in light of their position. He exhorts believers based on positional truth. Sanctified in Christ Jesus, not called to be. That word to be is in italics. It's not in the Greek. They're named, named saints. With all who in every place call on the name of Lord Jesus Christ, both theirs and ours. All these believers are saints. Now, look at just for instance, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. He speaks about the unrighteous who will not inherit the kingdom. Now, inheriting has a rewards concept. He could be referring here to both believer and unbeliever in the context here, who are unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Certainly, there are believers who are doing these things. There were believers fornicating, uh, worshiping idols, and so forth. Uh, but notice verse 11, he says, Such were some of you. Now, some of the believers were continuing in those very things. But he bases that on their position. You're washed, you're cleansed of all your sins. You're set apart positionally, you're holy. You're justified, declared righteous. You have imputed righteousness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He exhorts them based on their identity in Christ because they're holy not to do those things. Now, notice he exhorts them based on positional truth in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Members of Christ were where? In Christ, in him. Right? We're part of his body. So shall I then take the member of Christ and make the member of a prostitute? Certainly not. You're, the two are becoming one flesh physically. I'm taking a body member, body part that belongs to him. I'm joined to the Lord, verse 17. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, verse 19. And therefore, verse 20, I'm bought at a price. Notice, he refers to their identity. When he exhorts them to live godly, he goes back to the fact of who they are in Christ. Especially verse 20. Therefore, notice this, for you were bought at a price, therefore, based on that, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. You belong to him. Your body is not to be used for whatever purpose it feels like. We're not to engage in sexual morality. We belong to Christ. We're holy in our position. So he exhorts them, based on their identity in Christ, to be holy. So actually, positional truth is not a license of sin. It reminds us of our identity in Christ and an encouragement to live holy life. Because I'm holy in my position, I'm going to be holy in my practice. See, That is the motivation for these believers. We need to remind ourselves of that. Now look at Hebrews 10, 10 and 14. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 10 and 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Now that's unfortunate, that translation. Here is one of the, here's the few time, one of the few times I disagree with the New King James. I like that translation. We always have to look at the context, though, first of all. You know, the old King James has it right in this sense. The old King James and the New American Standard, I'll read the New American Standard, says this, For by one offering is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Those who are sanctified. And you say, well, there's a, there is a uh, present tense verb. We have the word hakiazo, it's a present passive participle. You said it's a present participle, so it should be translated, are being sanctified. But, wait a second now. And I looked at the premier Greek grammarian of the last century, A.T. Robertson. I looked at his Greek grammar on this. And A.T. Robertson said, the present tense can be simply descriptive, present participle can simply be descriptive. In the Greek, this acts as a noun. The participle has parts of a noun in a verb, right? That's what a participle is. So actually in the Greek we have a definite article before the word sanctified. And you can see this in the Greek. I can show you the lexicon in the Greek. 
In essence, he's simply describing the believer. So the translation in New American Standard is correct. By one offering is perfected for all time those who are sanctified. It's descriptive. He's describing the believers in Christ. Through that one offering, God has perfected what Christ did. He set us in Christ. We are holy in him. Now, if we go back to simply four verses, he tells us this. By Christ obeying the will of God, we are set apart, sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. See that? Look at verse 10. By Christ's obedience, being obedient unto death, through that offering, we have been set apart. And this is positional sanctification, by the way. Through the offering of the body of Christ, once, once, this is not ongoing, one time. Think about the implication of that. Through that one time sacrifice, I am perfectly holy in my position forever. That's phenomenal when you think about it. And so verse 14 is expressing not something different. It's still the context. He has perfected forever. How about that? Those who are, King James, sanctified. Correct. Correct. We are sanctified. Now, uh, I'll show you here the, the uh, Robert Dean. Uh, Robert Dean's notes. Here is a, here this or are sanctified. It has an article with it, so it's translated as if it is a noun. It really doesn't have that much of a verbal idea to it. It is just saying, it is like saying to believers, he has perfected forever believers. Believers are perfected forever. We're holy in Christ Jesus. All right, and then Jude, Jude verse 1, Jude 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, a brother of James, to those who are called sanctified by God the Father. This is not a separate group of believers who has had the second work of grace. They're set apart and preserved where? Notice the position here. Where? In Jesus Christ. See that? So these are believers that are holy in their position, set apart in Christ. Now let's finish these other two blessings. We are perfected forever. Hebrews chapter 10. Go back there. We have perfected forever those who are sanctified. So by the way, this Greek word, the eyes, the eye of completeness, we are complete in our position in Christ based on being set apart or sanctified in him. This is permanent, a permanent position of completeness in Christ Jesus, in our union with Christ Jesus. This is not talking about sinless perfectionism. He's not talking, and this is where, by the way, uh, the holiness group that take these passions, Hebrews, about perfection, they teach a doctrine of sinless perfectionism but based on this. But it's not talking about our experience, it's talking about our position. We're perfect not in our experience. We're perfect in our position. See, that's where they get their false doctrine of sinless perfectionism from. You gotta have the second work of grace to be perfect. Well, our perfection is where? In our position in Christ. Our perfection is not in our experience. So that's how these groups draw their text from. They confuse position and practice. And uh, we can't do that. Uh, then we're qualified for inheritance, Colossians 1.12. We'll expand on that later uh, about the believer's inheritance. But this is a guaranteed inheritance. Giving thanks to the Father is qualified for us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. Notice this is the saints' inheritance. All who are holy in Christ, all believers. In the light, that's positional truth too. Paul talks about that in Ephesians, being in the light in our position. Now we are to walk as children of light, but positionally we're in the light. We're light in the Lord. So being in Christ, we have an inheritance. 
We have an inheritance guaranteed. We have a, obviously, what, what does that include? A resurrection body, a home in heaven. You know, we're all guaranteed. Every believer is guaranteed an inheritance. And then there's a double inheritance that we can earn as a reward. Now, let me summarize this then. Imputation. What is imputation? The transfer of one's personal sins or righteousness to another. Theologically, the definition of imputation. The word literally in the Greek means to credit. So we are credited with Christ's righteousness. Jesus was credited with our sins. Or the idea of putting or placing upon another. So we looked at that. Um, therefore, our sin debt was placed on Christ. He was credited with our sins. God the Father punished the Son when as sin, he became sin for us. Isaiah 56, 3, 6 says, The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's imputation, right? The Lord laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah 53, 5. But whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. At the moment of faith alone, God imputes righteousness. Mean, look at this. Righteousness is given to the believer. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. We are made the righteousness of God in him. So God credits us with his righteousness the moment we believe. By the way, what's the next thing after that, logically? Justification. Once we are seen in Christ, we have his righteousness. And Christ views us as righteous in him. He said, you're righteous. That's justification. Justification means what? To declare righteous. First of all, we have to be righteous through imputation. Once we're righteous through being in un united with him, he sees us in Christ, and he declares us righteous in him. We're justified by faith. And we're justified in that top circle that you have imputed righteousness. And part of righteousness is as we walk in him. I wanted to get to this earlier, but showing you that positional sanctification is the same. It flows from our identity in Christ. We're holy. We're a saint. Sainthood flows from our position. It doesn't flow from our experience. What does flow from our experience is being holy, walking, living a holy life. That's called progressive sanctification. That occurs in our fellowship. That's through the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. The baptism ministry of the Holy Spirit deals with our position. The filling ministry of the Holy Spirit deals with, deals with our fellowship. See the distinction? And the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit relates to our ultimate sanctification. Should have started out with this chart. <laughs> but uh, this is occurring, <clears throat> occurs at the rapture. We will ultimately be made holy at the return of Christ to the church. Our bodies will be changed at that point. We'll be made like Christ. So put it again. Our sins were transferred to Christ. Almost ran off the page here. I have to adjust that. It's still on him. And then Christ's righteousness is given to the believer. That's called the great exchange. All right, let's our heads. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the believer's identity in Christ, one of the many things you've given to us, the moment of faith in Christ alone. We are given perfect righteousness because our imputation, the one who became sin for us, who knew no sin, made us the righteousness of God in him. And once we believe the gospel, we are credited with perfect righteousness. We are holy. We are righteous. We have an inheritance. And we are blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Help us as believers continue to live in light of our identity in Christ Jesus. Certainly you want us to live a holy life. You want us to be obedient to your commands. So help us to in our experience to reflect upon our identity and live accordingly. And we ask these things in Christ's name.